This is what I love about CEREC. Well, there's a lot of things I like about CEREC, particularly Prime Scan, and that would be the implant restoration. There's two ways to do it. There's either a one piece or a two piece. Quite often I'm using two piece when I'm in my aesthetic theater. One thing we have to deal with, particularly with the flow of the software, is once you do your scan post scans and you render into your model screen, the first screen that shows up is the gingival mask option. So when do we use the gingival mask option? Because that forms the sub gingival emergence relative to how the tissue is scanned in to the quadrant, or we're not gonna use the gingival mask, which will give you a emergence that's more generic which actually can work better most of the time if you have a thick tissue biotype. And it also depends about where that implant platform is placed. Is it subosseous? What method I use, whether it's a gingival mask or not, will depend about am I forming my soft tissues with a transitional restoration or a transitional anatomical healing collar, or am I not gonna use that? It will make a difference on how I design also with the thickness of my mucosa so let's go through the two processes in this video. I'll actually show you side by side. One is additive, one is subtractive in that subgingival emergence. There are certain principles that we use to nail that subgingival emergence. So when we screw it down, it's gonna look great. People don't get food impaction in that subgingival emergence and proximal contours. It's real important that you set up your proximal contacts on the adjacent teeth. So recontour if you need to or reshape them or optimize the restorations next door. You may have to upgrade those to get some great interproximal contacts. So stay ahead of the game on that one because you want it to work really well. But when we're doing this right, I love controlling my implant restorations because I love controlling that sub gingival emergence because it makes all the difference. I had a client in just the other day, I love it. I've done two implants on them and I asked him the question, can you tell a difference between your implant restorations and your normal teeth as far as function, whether they're impacting food or not. He goes, no, I can't. <laughs> and that's what I want. If I can get it every time, not always, if they have a lot of recession or based on where that implant platform is, sometimes you can't always do that. But now that we're thinking more about the crown down technique, so we're placing that platform in consideration of the hard tissue, which is the bone, but also in consideration of the biotype, and that rich tissue, that makes a big difference in how you can restore. So I'm really big into the crown down technique. I want thicker mucosa than not, so that makes a difference on the implant type I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use a switch platform and bury that subosseous. When I can do that, I get a much better result. So let's go through the video about building the sub gingival contour with a mask or not a mask. They both work extremely well. When designing your sub gingival emergence, there are several principles we want to look at. A lot of it depends on your biotype. My objective is I want to avoid food impaction. If we have a thin biotype, we're going to use a concave emergence. And if we have a thick biotype, meaning the mucosa is thick, we're going to use a convex. We need to know that when we're going into our sub gingival design. Here's a case where we used a gingival mask and used the shape of the soft tissue of the sulcus. This is under emerged. It will look good in the mouth, but there'll be a food trap. The other option is to create a better subgingival emergence so we can expand those soft tissues without over expanding them and create a seal so we don't see food impaction and we have really good soft tissue support without recession. Here's the basic principle that I look at. There's a baseline, that's the root trunk. That should be the size of the root trunk and that's what our super gingival crown emerges off of, out of that soft tissue. Subgingivally, I want the one millimeter subgingival to be equal to the emergence of a root trunk, unless we have a really thin biotype. But in most cases, posteriorly, we can abide by this principle and get really good tissue support without seeing food impaction when we're done with that final restoration. When we're considering our software workflow, we're gonna fit the restoration to the arch, get the crown baseline emergence, that's the super gingival, and then the sub gingival emergence is established in our workflow. However, that is set up in the model screen. Once your models render, the very first screen that you see in the model screen is edit the baseline. 
we want to consider do we use a gingival mask or do we not use a gingival mask? Let's review the two. If we use a gingival mask, what we do is draw the baseline, which is the emergence for the final crown restoration, off of the soft tissue. It's like an ovate ponic. You want it to equal the size of a root trunk. You want it to line up with the buccal and lingual components of your arch. What we'll then do is create a subgingival emergence that will support that tissue so the emergence looks really nice. It's not under-emerged nor is it over-emerged. The beauty of using the baseline is the subgingival emergence will reflect the soft tissue. Now, in a case like this where the sulcus is not preformed, we have to build up and add form and shape to that subgingival emergence. Now, the other option is to not use a gingival mask. When we use that approach, the soft tissue will have more of a generic emergence off the tie base. And when you look at it under this illustration, it's a little full. So a case like this, we want to subtract. This emergence right here, particularly on the buckle, is going to be over-emerged. So here we see the two options. We have a fully emerged subgingival, maybe it's over-emerged, versus a gingival mask, which is under-emerged on the right. So with the left approach, what we're going to do is use subtractive, which is usually the smooth and removal tool. And on the right side, using a gingival mask, we're going to use additive, where we're going to build up to the proper emergence using the same principle. And that is the one millimeter subgingival equals a root trunk, and then we're going to feather the emergence down to the tie base. When you have good biotype, in a case like this, I find that not using the gingival mask is the most efficient, proficient way to get to your end design. In our design process, we're still going to finish the crown first, and then we go subgingival, creating the one millimeter subgingival equal to a root trunk. And then based off the soft tissue biotype, we'll go ahead and graduate that emergence down to the tie base. You can see that with the gingival mask on the right, it does take more time. Now, I use a gingival mask when I preform the sulcus, or if I have a really thin biotype, or if I don't have a lot of biotype. In other words, the implants at the bone and we have to create a fuller emergence. That's when I'm going to use the baseline and soft tissue. So this is a good illustration to show you both techniques. We have a subtractive technique, which is without the gingival mask. In most cases now, that's what I use. If we have a preformed sulcus that looks good, or if we have an implant that's not really buried subgingivally, it's at the bone or slightly above the bone, then I'm going to use a gingival mask, and that will be more effective in creating that subgingival emergence. But the principles are the same no matter which technique we're going to use. I really appreciate the Cerex software to implement the principles for good emergence, both super gingival and sub gingival. They both need to blend based off the tissue biotype. When we apply this principle of the one millimeter sub gingival equaling a root trunk, it's very predictable. So let's think about which technique we want to use. I'm going to use the gingival mask if it's anteriorly, because I want to control that baseline, and that's the emergence of the crown off the soft tissue, and then build that subgingival tissue, one millimeter subgingival to equal a root trunk, unless you have a really thin bile type. But most posterior cases, if I have three millimeters or more of connective tissue from the implant platform up, and a good tissue biotype, I'm not going to use the gingival mask. So what we're going to do is slightly subtract so we get that nice emergence, of where the one millimeter subgingival equals a root trunk, and then what we're going to do is design that subgingival emergence right down to the tie base platform. I have found this to be so consistent, and when we screw these down, we're going to get some blanching. So I'm going to anesthetize the patient and screw it down. I like to preserve that connective tissue. I'm usually not removing it now like I used to with electrosurge or a laser just to clear out some of that connective tissue. As long as I don't get excessive blanching more than 10 minutes, then we're going to be just fine. I've been doing this way for years. I've never had what I call a necrosis pathological situation. So if you have any questions or comments, make sure you 
post them below. I wanna hear from you guys. I like the interaction that we get on this website. I love making these videos, but most importantly, we're all learning together. If you have any ideas or comments, make sure you post them because I wanna hear, that's right, from you guys. So talk to you later, bye. Thanks for watching this video. The way you can support this channel is subscribe and hit that bell that will notify you next time a video is posted. I want to grow this channel and the best way you can help me is to share this with others. So make sure you share this link with colleagues that would benefit from this channel. In the meantime, I'll talk to you in the next video. Bye.